All right. Thank you, President Klaus. Uh, last year, I mentioned that we, at the Heartland Institute, we have a policy against allowing politicians to speak at our events. Um, and we made an exception for President Klaus last year, uh, and I think we were wise to do so. I think he's just an amazing guy and a valuable ally. Uh, President Klaus's reference to who I assume was Barack Obama um, reminded me of something that Richard Epstein told me. Uh, Richard Epstein is a professor of law at the University of Chicago and for many years was a colleague of Barack Obama. And he said, uh, Mr. Obama is a very good listener, very good listener. But in all the years that he had these conversations with him, he never knew Obama to change his mind. Uh, so let's hope that he reads that book and let's hope that he might change his mind. I want to mention two things that are in your bag before I introduce the uh, next speaker. Um, these are two new publications from the Heartland Institute. The first is called The Skeptic's Handbook uh, and it's by Joanne Nova. Joanne is with us somewhere in the room. Joanne, can you stand up if you're here? Where is she? There she is. This is a really terrific uh, publication. I hope that you have a chance to look at it. It's uh, designed as an outreach publication, so it's something that you can uh, share with your brother-in-law, your kids, um, your dentist, uh, and your elected official, other people with seventh and eighth grade reading levels, <laughs> I think can appreciate that. Oh, that reminds me. We have elected officials with us here tonight. <laughs> um, and I'm delighted. Uh, I believe we've got approximately 50 state legislators uh, in the room tonight. You guys are real heroes. Could you stand up, please, if you're an elected official? There we go. It is a challenge to stand up against global warming alarmism in Europe. It's also really tough to do it in state capitals all across the country. So these guys and gals are real heroes in the fight uh, on climate change. The second publication in your bag is, uh, Is the U.S. Surface Temperature Record Reliable? by Anthony Watts. Is Anthony Watts here? I haven't seen him. There we go. And this is really important stuff. As many of you know, Anthony has been going around the country with a group of volunteers taking pictures of the temperature stations, the actual land-based temperature stations uh, that are used to try to estimate what the change has been over the last century in temperatures in the United States. Um, and he has taken pictures of almost two-thirds or three-quarters 75%, three quarters of all of the stations. Can you imagine that? Um, it's over a thousand stations. And what he has discovered is just amazing, that many of these stations are obviously located in places where they are not going to produce an accurate record of temperature. Uh, they're in the middle of parking lots or next to freeways, uh, next to air conditioning vents, um, all sorts of uh, sources of man-made heat. So I think it's a very important contribution to the debate. You're going to be hearing a lot more about it. The Heartland Institute has printed 150,000 copies of each of these publications, and we're sending them to all elected officials, editors, educators, uh, civic and business leaders all across the country. All right, and I mentioned that it's difficult to take on environmentalism in Europe. It's also very difficult to do that here in the United States, in our universities, and in our colleges. And we have with us tonight one of the most distinguished atmospheric physicists in the world, a man who was awarded the James B. McIlwain. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Is it McIlwain? That's close enough, Dick says. Um, medal which is given by the American Geophysical Union to recognize significant contributions to the geophysical sciences by an outstanding young scientist. 
He received the Clarence Leroy Meisinger Award, which is given by the American Meteorological Society to atmospheric scientists who have shown outstanding ability and are under the age of 40 at the time that they are nominated. And he's received the Jewel G. Charney Award, which is also given by the American Meteorological Society to recognize the authors of highly significant research or development achievement in the atmospheric or hydrologic sciences. Now, such a distinguished scientist could very easily have chosen to avoid the controversy and the notoriety that comes from speaking out against global warming alarmism, but Dr. Richard Lindzen doesn't tolerate fools lightly. Dr. Lindzen is the Alfred P. Sloan Professor of Meteorology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's been there since 1983. He holds degrees in physics and applied mathematics. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington and the University of Oslo, and was a research scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. He taught at the University of Chicago before stepping down and going to Harvard University, <laughs> where he held the burden chair in dynamic meteorology and served as director of the Center for Earth and Planetary Physics. Dr. Lindzen is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Meteorological Society. The title of his presentation tonight is Climate Alarm, What Are We Up Against and What to Do? Please welcome Dr. Richard Lindzen. Thank you. I wish to thank Cho and the Heartland Institute for organizing this event. I think it's important uh, to provide such a forum. And like President Klaus, you sometimes wonder how effective it is, but that shouldn't stop one from trying. I think one point should be understood as one discusses the science. And that is that global warming alarm, as far as I can tell, has always been a political movement, a highly organized one. And although it took me a while to realize this, opposing it has always, okay, has always been an uphill battle. Yeah, I think. In any event, what I'd like to do in this talk, and I hope I don't go on too long, is to remind people of a few simple truths that our side often forgets. And the first of these, and I think there are people here like Roy and others who know this, is that being skeptical about global warming does not by itself make one a good scientist. Nor does endorsing global warming make one per se a poor scientist. And one of the most difficult things I think for someone who is actively involved in the scientific community is to realize in my case, for instance, that most of the atmospheric scientists who I respect do endorse global warming. The important point, however, is that the science that they do that I respect is not about global warming. Endorsing global warming just makes their lives easier. I'll give you some examples. I mean, for example, I have a colleague Kerry Emanuel. We're on good, friendly terms. He in, works in tropical meteorology. Uh, he received relatively little formal recognition for many years until he suggested that hurricanes might become stronger in a warmer world. This is a position that I think he has since backed away from somewhat. But as soon as he made that point, he was inundated with professional recognition. 
Another colleague, Carl Wunsch, who is an outstanding oceanographer, professionally calls into question virtually all alarmist claims concerning sea level, ocean temperature, and ocean modeling. But he assiduously avoids association with skepticism. If nothing else, he has several major oceanographic programs to worry about, and moreover, his politics are clearly liberal. In some ways, to me, one of the most interesting examples is from here in New York. It's Wally Broker at Columbia University's Lamont Laboratory. His work has clearly shown that sudden climate change occurs without anthropogenic influence and is a property of cold rather than warm climates. However, he staunchly beats the drums for alarm and he's richly rewarded for doing so. For a much larger group of scientists, the fact that they can make ambiguous or even meaningless statements that can be spun by alarmists and that the alarming spin leads politicians to increase funding provides very little incentive to complain about the spin. The second point is that most arguments about global warming, and I think President Klaus mentioned this essentially, boil down to science versus authority. For much of the public, authority will generally win since they do not wish to deal with science. For a basically political movement, as the global warming issue most certainly is, an important task is to co-opt the sources of authority. And that's very important to keep in mind. The global warming movement has done this with great success and then turns around and says that this co-opted authority is the reason for its activities. It's exactly the opposite. Thus, for over 20 years, the National Academy of Sciences had a temporary nominating group, temporary for over 20 years, designed to facilitate the election of environmental activists to the Academy. The current president of the Academy is one of these, Ralph Cicerone. The American Association for the Advancement of Science has been headed by James McCarthy and John Holdren in recent years, and these have been public advocates for global warming alarm. Holdren is now President Obama's nominee for science advisor. There are numerous further examples. How often have we heard a legitimate scientific argument answered by the claim that the alarmist scenario is endorsed by, for example, the American Physical Society, regardless of their lack of expertise in the issue? How often have some of you, who are perhaps more curious about this, heard innocuous claims by various professional societies taken as endorsements of alarm. We'll come back to that. How often, how often have you heard that any particular argument has been dealt with by realclimate.org's website, ignoring the fact that this is an advocacy website designed to assure warming alarmists that the basis for alarm still exists. My third point is related to the second point, and that is that the success of environmentalism with respect to authority also gives the alarm movement control over carrots and sticks, which in turn is what makes it so convenient for scientists to go along. The carrots, it should be remembered, are as important as the sticks, though the sticks hardly are irrelevant when it comes to a young scientist funding, publication, and promotion. Returning to the carrots, for example, John Holdren was long on the board of the MacArthur Foundation, which has awarded genius grants to numerous environmental activists. 
A more ironic example is an award allegedly honoring the memory of the late Bill Nirenberg. Some of you may know who he was. He was not only the director of Scripps Oceanographic Institution, but he was a very perceptive and active skeptic of climate alarm. This award is now annually given to an alarmist, most recently to Jim Hansen. Again, one could go on at great length. The process of co-opting science on behalf of a political movement has had an extraordinarily corrupting influence on science, especially since the issue has been a major motivation for funding. Most funding for climate would not be there without this issue. And it should be added, most science funded under the rubric of climate does not actually deal with climate, but rather with the alleged impact of arbitrarily assumed climate change. This is very much the issue with the polar bears, the issue with disease, the issue with cockroaches, the issue with obesity, and so on. It's become standard, whatever you're studying, include in your proposal the effect of global warming on that issue. In any event, one of the things about impacts is that they generally are dependent on regional forecasts. And quoting the leading scientist at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, I should mention that's widely regarded as the foremost atmospheric modeling center, the guy is Tim Palmer, such forecasts are no better than guesses. Now, that might seem like a problem to you from a scientific perspective, but from a propagandistic or impact perspective, that's wonderful. Because guesses have the advantage of allowing anything to be projected, and they are so used. If you look, for instance, even at the intercomparison of models for Arctic sea ice, the predictions for 2100 range from zero reduction to 100% reduction. You have your pick. In any event, regional forecasts are at the heart of numerous state initiatives to fight climate change. Uh, these initiatives are usually prepared by something called the Center for Climate Strategies. This is a Pennsylvania-based environmental advocacy group that purports to help states determine for themselves how to develop climate change policies. As Paul Chesser of the John Locke Foundation pointed out, this is not exactly correct. If you look at these proposals, they're almost all identical. CCS tightly controls these commissions, and these commissions consider proposals primarily from a menu of options presented by CCS themselves. Nearly all the choices represent new taxes or higher prices on energy, increased costs of government, new regulations for business, and reduced energy producing options for utilities and therefore consumers. I should mention that CCS is funded largely by a multi-million dollar global warming alarmist foundation with the innocent sounding name, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. What can be done? Well, here I'll turn to a variety of proposals, both naive and perhaps less naive. The most obvious point, I think, is to persevere. We shouldn't give up. We should try to better understand the science and in particular to emphasize logic, which ultimately has to trump alleged authority. Generally, there is a deep disconnect between the consensus statements that commonly only repeat the trivial points that there has been some warming and that man's emissions have caused some part of this, and the claims of catastrophe made by the advocates. Try to stress these differences. With respect to better understanding the science, 
It's my view that the observations of almost a decade ago that outgoing long wave radiation, this is heat radiation, associated with warmer surface temperatures was much greater than models predicted, provided as good evidence as one could hope for that model sensitivities were much too high. However, without an adequate understanding of the physics, the point is largely missed. How can one communicate this to the public? Actually, the science isn't all that hard. John Sununu, who will be speaking at this meeting, former governor of New Hampshire, chief of staff to the first President Bush, and a professor of mechanical engineering at Tufts University, offered an easily appreciated example of positive and negative feedback. And I like this one. He suggested in your car, the gas and brake pedals act as negative feedbacks to reduce speed when you're going too fast and to increase it when you're going too slow. The example of a positive feedback would be if someone were to reverse the position of the pedals without informing you. <laughs> so that now you would be increasing your speed when you're going too fast and slowing down when you're going too slow. Now, on the face of it, this does not seem like a reasonable way to build a system. And yet, alarming predictions depend critically on the fact that models have large positive feedbacks. The crucial question is whether nature actually behaves that way. The answer, I would suggest, is unambiguously no. Now let's see how one can test this. And, and this is amazing because we're arguing about temperatures and we're arguing about all this, but the issue has always been referred to as the greenhouse effect. Can one test that by itself? In the common, though somewhat inaccurate, picture of the greenhouse effect, greenhouse substances, they're mainly thin, high clouds and water vapor, but they also include carbon dioxide, methane, freons, and other things, acts as a blanket. It inhibits the emission of infrared or heat radiation. We know that in the absence of feedbacks, in which water, these feedbacks say that water vapor and clouds act to amplify the effect of added CO2, in these things, if we increase temperature, that will lead to a certain increase in this heat radiation. With positive feedbacks, this amount of radiation will be reduced. Uh, the idea here is just in terms of the blanket imagery, the blanket has gotten thicker. Current models indeed behave this way. If you force a current model with observed sea surface temperature, it emits very little thermal radiation as the temperature goes up. On the other hand, we also know that the 90s were warmer than the 80s, and during this period, there were satellites, Irby, Ceres, and so on, which were measuring the emitted heat radiation. What at least four independent groups all confirmed, and here, I guess I could put this slide up. I don't know, yeah. Okay, uh, what, if I could uh, find where I am, is that if you look at the top figure, uh, this is a very obscure looking uh, diagram, you actually have a crucial piece of information that tells us that models are greatly exaggerating climate. It might not be obvious to you, but what it tells us is that the greenhouse blanketing in the models, if I had a pointer, I, I don't know, does this work as a pointer? Probably not. Uh, is about seven times greater than it is in models. Excuse me. It, seven times greater than it is in models. This statement is a little botched. Here's the picture up close. And if you look at it 
more closely. What you see is from 1995 to 1989, the red and dashed lines representing models and the satellite data, ERBS, are in agreement. That was tuned. As you go into the 90s, you begin seeing that the red is much more variable than the dashed line. On the average, both are following the sea surface temperature and their ups and downs, but the red is typically seven times larger. Now, if it were three times larger, that would be no feedback. Seven times larger means this system is behaving as though it has a very strong negative feedback. Now, this should not be surprising that nature would in fact be dominated by stabilizing rather than destabilizing feedbacks. Someone, actually an environmentalist, had suggested that climate in models is an, an, is an example of unintelligent design. <laughs> I think this is something modelers are far more capable of than is nature. Now, <laughs> Getting people, including many scientists, to understand this is crucial. Once it is understood, the silliness of the whole issue becomes evident. Unfortunately, though, those who are committed to warming the alarm as either a vehicle for a postmodern coup d'etat or for illicit profits will obviously try to obfuscate matters. As important as the above is, moreover, it does not eliminate the need for more institutional approaches. These are largely limited by the minimal resources available to rectify the present situation. Indeed, given the minimal resources available to those who are truly interested in how climate actually works, and the immense resources and power of the environmental movement it is astounding that the resistance has been as effective as it has been. That said, one should not underestimate the impressive degree of organization behind the climate alarm movement. Notable in this regard has been the Climate Action Network. Ever since 1989, this network has coordinated the activities of hundreds of environmental NGOs all over the world. However, should some benefactor create a climate institute that could recruit outstanding scientists regardless of their position on global warming and provide the resources for truly independent research protected from political manipulation, then it is possible that the corrupt state of the science could in time be rectified. So far, however, this would appear to be a pipe dream. A possibly more practical undertaking would be to undermine the authority of scientific organizations. In these organizations, you have a situation where a few activist members, usually on the board, have managed to speak for the entire membership without polling the membership. That's been typical of every organization I belong to. I would suggest that one useful tactic would be to have a major campaign to get thousands of scientists to resign from professional societies that have taken unrepresentative stands on the warming issue while making the reason for the resignation unambiguous and public. This would, in my opinion, be far more effective than simply collecting thousands of signatures for petitions. The global warming issue has done much to set back climate science. In particular, the notion that climate is one-dimensional, which is to say that it is totally described by some fictitious global mean temperature and some single gross forcing, a la increased CO2, 
is grotesque in its oversimplification. And here I must reluctantly <laughs> have to add that this error is often perpetuated on our side by those attempting to explain climate with solar variability. Unlike greenhouse forcing, solar forcing is sufficiently vague that one can't reject it, and I'm not proposing to do so. However, acting as though this is the alternative to greenhouse forcing is asking for trouble insofar as it gives credence and perpetuates the incorrect paradigm essential to anthropogenic global warming. We should think about that. The remember, we're dealing with a very small amount of warming. When you plot the range of global warming on a chart of highs and lows for the day, it is a thin line that does not compete with the daily variability, the monthly variability, with anything else. It looks like a line. When you're dealing with anything that small, of course the things that Tony Watts is looking at are very important because it's a delicate matter. But the proper null hypothesis, and you should understand what a null hypothesis it is, it is the running po the simplest possible answer against which you would compare any active answer. The null hypothesis is that there is no need whatsoever for external forcing in order to produce such behavior. The unsteady and even turbulent motions of the ocean and atmosphere are forever moving heat from one place to another on time scales from days to centuries. And in doing so, they leave the system out of equilibrium with the sun, and thus leading to fluctuations in temperature. The thought that these turbulent fluctuations depend demand specific causes is also absurd. It's about as absurd as calling for specific causes for each whirl in a bubbling brook. Finally, I would suggest that however grim things may appear, I think we'll eventually win against anthropogenic global warming alarm simply because we are right and they are wrong. <laughs> now, There are many reasons for being confident of this. However, we have just gone over one of the most important scientific reasons. The satellite, satellite records of outgoing heat radiation show that the climate is dominated by negative feedbacks and that the response to doubled or even quadrupled CO2 would be minimal. In a field as primitive as climate science, most of the alleged climate scientists are not even aware of this basic relation. And these days, one can be confident that once they are, many will, in fact, try to alter the data. Under the circumstances, it is not surprising that the public is not likely to understand the situation particularly well. On the other hand, we have the fact that the global mean temperature anomaly has not increased statistically significantly since at least 1995, not even 1998. I mean, uh, if we have the slide, I forget who I zap with this. No, uh, can I go backwards? Yeah, yeah. You know, this is the picture of temperature, I usually indicate the uncertainty uh, with the purple fuzz. Uh, there's a reason for that. Error bars look too definite. Errors sort of decay with distance. But in any event, you see the picture that has been referred to of temperature increases until 1940, decreases, then increases. And then you see that little flat section at the top in any event, if you now, oops, I forget which. 
If you look at recent years since 1995, you see that the fuzz for 96 overlaps, or 97 overlaps 95, and it's gone down since then. So here you, you have this fact that warming for at least 10, 15 years has basically stopped. Now, the thing about this is this does not disprove anthropogenic global warming. But for the public, this fact is likely to be crucial. Now, for some of us, this is an occasional source of frustration. That is to say, you have physical evidence that is very compelling, and you have a temperature record which you know does not prove anything, but of course has an impact on the public because they've heard about warming. The only thing I can say is that given this is a political rather than a scientific issue, public perception is important. Moreover, the temperature record does demonstrate at least one very important point, namely that natural climate variability remains sufficiently large to preclude the identification of climate change with anthropogenic forcing. Now, if you actually looked at the IPCC, even the fourth assessment, they're very clear in the text that the attribution claim, however questionable we may regard it, was contingent on the assumption that models had adequately handled this natural internal variability. The temperature record of the last 14 years clearly shows that this assumption was wrong. To be sure, this period constitutes a warm period in the instrumental record. And as a result, many of the years are among the warmest in the record. But at least this audience should be aware that this does nothing to mitigate the failure of nature to properly follow the models. The fact that you have record-breaking years does not tell you that the trend was not there. And when I hear that argument commonly presented, you should be prepared to reject it. To claim otherwise betrays either gross ignorance or grosser dishonesty. Unfortunately, when it comes to global warming hysteria, Neither has been in short supply. Thank you.